Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. I hope you're breathing okay. I'm not sure if I am, but actually I am because for the Wilderness Medical Society podcast of the week, I guess, is we're going to have a little discussion about COVID. First, I will tell you a little bit about improvised techniques, and some of you may have seen this on the internet, but what I did is I fashioned one of these snorkeling masks. It's a full-face snorkeling mask, and instead of using the long tube, which would increase dead space, I went ahead and put on a little HEPA filter at the end. <laughs> and I did a fit test yesterday, and guess what? It actually worked. What I wanted to do is talk to Dr. Scott McIntosh. Yes, you know, Big Scott. And we're going to talk about some myths that have been going around with regard to the pathophysiology of COVID and high altitude illness, specifically high altitude pulmonary edema. And Scott, it's great to have you here. Welcome. Hey, thanks, Daryl. It's great to be here. It's a beautiful day out in Park City, and luckily the weather doesn't care about pandemics and other stuff, so um, we can go keep going on in the outdoors. Yeah. Reset button. I hear you. <laughs> well, you know what I was doing, Scott? I was reading this article, and it actually came out. The article is entitled, The Cetazolamide Nephetapine and Phosphodiesterase Inhibitors Rationale for Their Utilization as an Adjunct for the Treatment of uh, COVID-19. And it's very interesting because this author, it looks like it's more of a review article. And of course, we don't have a lot of randomized studies for this illness, but there's a discussion about how both have certain characteristics in common. And if you read through this, you'll see that there's a table and it compares that Obviously, both have a level of hypoxia, both have tachypnea, both have decreased uh, PaCO2 levels, ground glass opacities. You can read this. And I think this has been going around, Scott, even on the Twitterverse. I've seen this table going around. But here's my question. Is this really so? Because I think at least with high altitude pulmonary edema, we have to address hypoxic pulmonary artery vasoconstriction. And I heard you guys who just came out with the guidelines for treating high altitude illness in the WMS guidelines may have a different opinion. What do you think? Well, yeah, and I applaud all the folks who are taking care of these critical COVID patients in Burke and Italy and uh, Louisiana and Seattle. And here in Utah, we're seeing modest numbers of patients through the emergency department and in our ICUs, but not the, not the volume that uh, some other people are seeing. So I absolutely commend those who are thinking outside the box and thinking, well, how can we treat these patients better? And uh, what what I've been hearing from people on our floors, medical floors, and, and other folks on the, on the uh, East and West Coasts are that some of these COVID patients will go from, you know, being um, fairly, um, you know, stable, maybe a little bit hypoxic in the 80s and on the medical floor, but then go in the next, you know, next hour or two, go from being a, a talking patient to then um, needing to be intubated and going to the ICU. And then obviously some of these folks are, are dying. And so it's, it's definitely challenged a lot of the critical care docs that are taking care of a lot of these, uh, these folks. And that's, I think, where, where a, lot, a lot of these hypotheses have come from. Now, I, th I think it's best to start with some of the physiology behind uh, COVID and ARDS, and then we can talk about the physiology of high altitude pulmonary edema, or HAPE, as we call it. Um, so COVID uh, is an inflammatory process, right? It's a viral pneumonia that affects all parts of the lung, from the alveoli to the uh, capillary beds, and, and that, uh, that inflammatory response really um, guides where this clinical course is going to be. And so if you think about a disease process where the underlying process is inflammatory, you can have alveolar breakdown, you can have alveolar collapse, you can have pulmonary edema in these uh, ARDS patients that's caused by, uh, caused by COVID and, uh, and, and with the end result of being um, pulmonary edema. So that's some of the basics of, uh, of ARDS caused by COVID. 
Uh, let's turn to Hape now. So, Daryl, you, we're, we're both mountaineers, and, and you know, if we go up to uh, climb a peak in Alaska or the Himalaya, our pulmonary vasculature is going to vasoconstrict, and we're going to have some element of pulmonary hypertension. Now, you and I probably wouldn't notice it. I don't know if you've ever had hay, um, Gerald, but uh, you and I probably wouldn't notice, and most people wouldn't notice, um, notice going to high altitude. Uh, it, and uh, it, most people would not notice that vasoconstriction and, and slight increase in, in pulmonary hypertension. However, there's some people who almost reliably, when they go to high altitude, instead of you know, having a, a small amount of vasoconstriction when they go to high altitude, they might have a, a massive or over-exaggerated vasoconstriction that would cause a, 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 a markedly elevated uh, increase in the blood pressure of the pulmonary vasculature. And the lung at high altitude Altitude is going through this kind of dance pretty much second by second and minute to minute trying to shunt the blood to the areas that are rich with oxygen and shunt the blood away from areas of the lungs that are not uh, not very um, that, that don't have a, a high partial pressure of oxygen and so a lot of these people when they have that increased pulmonary hypertension it's flooding these areas where the, the body is already trying to shunt the, um, shunt the blood into good and bad spaces, and it kind of overwhelms with pressure that pulmonary, the pulmonary capillaries, and that's what causes the leak and pulmonary edema in high-altitude pulmonary edema. So then when you think about the treatments of high altitude pulmonary edema, so, and, and I know you've treated high altitude pulmonary edema patients before too, Almost always, these patients, if you give them supplemental oxygen and you get them down to a lower altitude, then that pulmonary hypertension will ease, the shunting will ease, and you'll have a more normal vascular flow in the lungs. And really, I mean, even, uh, even some of these severe cases, once you get them down to a lower altitude, if they're on supplemental oxygen, they'll almost reliably get better in, you know, in a number of hours. And most of the time, in 24 hours, they'll be you know, good to go, um, even, you know, even some of the most serious cases. Um, so if you think about the experience with, uh, with these awesome critical care docs who are taking care of the, the, the COVID slash ARDS patients, you can't just give them oxygen and they're going to get better, or you can't take them to a lower altitude. They, these people are on vents for, you know, five to 10 days. And if their body is able to let heal for back of lack of a better word if it's able to reverse that inflammation that's causing that those pulmonary the pulmonary injury then they get better usually after five or ten days and and then get transferred to the medical floor and hopefully do well but if their body does not do well with healing that inflammatory response, then of course the the hyp, uh, hypoxia uh, and other and other inflammatory responses can lead to other organs failing, so kidneys and et cetera, and that just kind of leads to a spiral. In which case, that person would go the other direction and not come off the ventilator and, and unfortunately die. So those. So when you think about the two diff the two processes, both of them can have an element uh, an element of pulmonary edema. Obviously, that's the hallmark in high altitude pulmonary edema. It it may be variable in the ARDS response to COVID, but the underlying physiology is is different. So when you think about treatments and if some of these preventions and or treatments from high altitude pulmonary edema, could we apply those to, uh, to these patients with uh, critical ARDS uh, from COVID is probably not. Because when you think about the, uh, well, the treatments, the medical treatments for uh, 
high altitude pulmonary edema include nifedipine, right? So that's a calcium channel blocker that, uh, that normally acts, that acts specifically on the pulmonary vasculature to decrease that, uh, the, uh, the pulmonary pressures. And, and also sildenafil and, uh, and tadalafil that were originally, uh, originally destined for uh, treating pulmonary hypertension. And of course, those were um, destined more for the side effects of, uh, right. of those medications. But if you, if you think about the underlying physiology, the, the COVID slash ARDS patients probably have a normal a normal pulmonary uh, blood pressure. Now, I, I don't know a whole lot of people who have swanned these and, and you know, really investigated it, but there's no reason to suggest that these uh, pulmonary artery pressures are as high as the ones with altitude pulmonary edema. Um, so it probably is not going to target the underlying mechanism of ARDS from COVID it, in that it's not going to resolve the underlying inflammation that's going on in, in the uh, alveoli of these, uh, of these patients. Yeah, and my understanding with this is that the whole, I guess, cascade with regard to ARDS or even the multi-system organ failure is from this thing called a cytokine storm, and that that actually might be initiated from the direct competition of COVID with the heme molecule in the RBCs. And then you're getting erythropoiesis. But once you get into that type of cycle, it's not quite irreversible, but the prognosis isn't very good. And right. it doesn't seem like the treatments that we would apply, whether it be oxygen, the uh, PDE5 inhibitors, nifedipine, any of those things would really do any good for this sort of pathophysiology. Right, right. Yeah, and one thing to, to, um, to be aware of as well is that the, most of the pulmonary edema patients that we take care of in the emergency department are from heart failure, right? So we just, the heart, heart is failing, blood backs up into the lungs, floods the alveoli. And so that's a cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Whereas we think well, high altitude pulmonary edema, the heart is normal. And, and, it's, and it's working normally, and it mostly, mostly affects you know, mountaineers and, and trekkers who are pushing themselves pretty hard up at, uh, um, up at these up at high altitudes. And we think that the heart is doing the same, or, or that, that the heart is in ARD slash COVID patients is doing uh, well too. Um, so again, there are some uh, overlaps in the, um, in the end result of ARDS slash hate patients, you know, and, and as as we you know we see more and more that uh, COVID can have a you know a, a huge spectrum of presentation, right? So you have some patients, some people who don't even know that they're infected, and then you have people who just have just crash with respiratory failure in you know in the matter in a matter of minutes, and that's uh, and I think that that's where some people are are comparing it to high altitude pulmonary edema because that exact spectrum of illness can happen with high altitude pulmonary edema as well. And so it's, I mean, it's very, um, I think it's very natural to, to try to connect these, these two in, um, in similar presentations. Wait a minute, here's the news flash. We just finished this video cast a few days ago. Today is Monday, April 13, 2020, and the article in High Altitude Medicine Biology on COVID-19 lung injury and not being high altitude pulmonary edema just came out. And as you'll see here, the authors are stated, Lukes, Freer, Grissom, McIntosh, Shani, Swenson, and Hackett. Enjoy it. This is new news. We think that because the underlying mechanisms just, just aren't, you know, aren't the same, even though the end presentation could appear similar, it probably would, these, these medical therapies, uh, nifedipine or phosphodiesterase inhibitors, probably wouldn't, um, wouldn't help. And in some cases, lowering someone's, um, lowering someone's pulmonary 
uh, pulmonary pressures when their body is really working hard to, you know, fight off this the inflammatory cascade, like you mentioned, it could even could even be deleterious. I applaud the the folks who are who are in the ICUs and 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 really looking at this critically. It, it's uh, you know it's it's a challenge. It's challenging for all of us, and I think that there are probably different ways of of treating these patients. We just haven't figured it out or figured out a magic bullet yet. One other thing I just might mention before we finish is that this whole idea of social distancing, you know, I you saw this uh, video cast that I did about a week, week and a half ago about the whole idea of social distancing, being careful with regard to putting yourself at risk for need of search and rescue. And I've been out here running in kind of my backyard in these trails and some of these trails are just getting full and people are going in groups of five or six and it's just crazy and i had just read this paper yesterday that with being downwind from people who would potentially carry this virus it increases that distance from six feet to more feet and that could be a mm -hmm. What have you guys experienced in Utah with regard to the social distancing in the outdoors? There's been a few rescues. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Utah uh, and Salt Lake City and, and here in Park City, we're, we're uh, outdoors people, we're adventurers, and we love being in the outdoors. And, and luckily there's, there's folks like, like my wife and I who have trails that come right from our house that aren't, you know, aren't as busy as what sounds like you're uh, you're talking about so we can go on hikes and not even see a, uh, a single person but the trailheads are are getting are getting busy and the the summit county here has closed a number of their trailheads because the, the parking lots are just so big and and just so much area to congregate so people go to all the all the other ones that are not closed including one close to uh close to our house here and it just be just kind of sets that up again in these other trailheads. So, um, but I, I think for the most part, people here in Summit County, I don't know if you all have seen the National Social Distancing website, uh, but they, Utah got a well a couple of weeks ago got a D minus as a grade for, <laughs> for for social distancing. However, I checked it again. I checked it again last night. Uh, and it is now B minus, so we're doing okay. Um, Summit County here, where where I live in Park City, uh, a couple weeks ago was a B minus, and now it's to an A minus. And it's interesting how they sounds like they are able to get metadata from people's cell phones, and uh, and I think that they include the laws in in each county and each state to try to predict uh, how you know how effective this this is or or it could be philosophically so i i i mean just looking looking out here there's not a lot of cars there's they i think people are are using different trailheads and and the volume on the trailheads is is getting a lot less and so i think people are people are finally getting it whereas two or three weeks ago people were still not not really all that convinced that this is what we needed to do you know, it's a little bit different here. I think we went from an F plus to I guess, <laughs> E plus so here in Bernalillo County, but that's great. Well, thanks so much, Scott, for taking the time out and talking about this important subject. And I uh, hope it's wrong and, you know, keep your mind going. And thanks for all you do in Utah. Thanks, you too, Daryl. And uh, yeah, I know that you and I had planned to be at a couple conferences here together and teaching over the next couple of months, but what do you do hopefully we'll come out of this stronger more more revived more motivated and more more adventurous that's right all right well cheers take care thanks daryl all right bye